Hi, Dr. Pelto here. Um, I'm going to go over uh, a slide uh, show right now about plantar fasciitis. So this is going to be the most comprehensive one that I've done up to this point. If you've watched the other ones, this is going to even be more comprehensive. So this is for you. If you're having pain when you get up at the bed in the morning, if you're having pain after you drive for a little bit and then you get up and stand and your heel hurts, uh, this is for you if you've had pain for a few weeks or if you've had it for a few months. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go over all the anatomy. I'm going to go over what causes it. Uh, I'm going to go over tons of questions that my patients actually ask me every day in the office. I'm going to answer each one of those. Uh, and I'm going to go into detail about all the different treatment options, what you should try, what you shouldn't try, what you can try at home, what your doctor is going to want to try, uh, and what uh, things you can do to avoid having a surgery. Okay, so I'm going to go through all of that today. Certainly, uh, if you have any other questions, you can post them on the bottom of this video, and I will try to answer them, and I'll try to include some of those questions here. So let's let's get into it. Uh, what is plantar fasciitis? So let's let's stop and take a little little understanding of what what it is. Okay, so the plantar fascia is this little white ligament that runs down from the back of the heel, uh, the bottom of the heel, all the way to the front. It, it's about as thick as a piece of bacon, thick cut bacon. That's what it looks like. And it, uh, there's also the Achilles tendon, which goes back. I'm showing you the Achilles because the Achilles is so important because if you have a tight Achilles, you're going to have a tight plantar fascia because if this pulls up in this direction, as you can see the arrow, this one is going to pull in, in the same direction. So it's going to make this tighter. That's why many of the, the treatments we focus on are loosening of the Achilles. Now, one thing you have to realize when you loosen it, this thing of the, this tendon and this also of the fascia, it doesn't loosen all that well because it's, it's fascia, it, it, it's fibrous. It, it doesn't stretch that well. What stretches better is the muscles are the muscles in the back of the calf. That's where most of our focus is on loosening up the back of the calf, um, doing uh, stretching for the, the fascia itself on the bottom of the foot doesn't work all that well unless the muscles are tight or other types of things are tight on the foot. If you look here at this other picture, this is, it shows where it inserts into the heel and it goes forward in those bands going to the front of the foot. Now the fascia is very large in the bottom of the foot, but usually it hurts right at the base or there can sometimes be a tear right here. So you have to be careful. You don't have something called the plantar fibroma instead, which can uh, commonly be mis mistaken. And there's also a tendon here that pulls down the big toe joint called the flexor hallucis longus. And sometimes that can be mistaken for that as well. And I just like to use this slide to show why bone spurs happen. If you have pulling, if this is a tight for a long, long period of time, your body's going to produce bone in that direction. That's what the bone spur is from. We don't typically uh, treat bone spurs on the bottom. Occasionally we do on the back. Okay. So that's exactly what plantar fasciitis is. Plantar fasciitis is an inflammation at the insertion region of the fascia. It's usually caused because of tightness and improper function of your body. It's not specifically uh, caused uh, by a heel spur. Okay, let's go next here. Uh, bear with me here. Okay, so um, next we're going to go here and talk about this is a dysfunction symptom index. And the reason I want to explain this is because many of my patients say, well, how come I have heel pain? I didn't really do anything. They didn't a lot of my patients, they might go to Disney, they might um, go for a, a start working out, they might do a, a hit class where they're jumping around. But some of my patients, nothing happens to them and they wonder why they have it. Now, this is a, um, a, a design that I made based on a conversation I had with my, my partner, Dr. Feldman. And so this is called the dysfunction symptom index. So you can see here, this is a symptom line. Okay. So this is where you're at. And if you go over the line, you're going to have symptoms. And if you're under the line, you're not going to have any symptoms. Okay, that's the first thing you have to realize. Then you also see here on the bottom, it's people's age. So as the age goes on, as you go forward, forward and you get older, um, you may have more dysfunction. And this is the issue. Many of us have dysfunction, but we're not having any symptoms. We haven't passed the symptom line. That's why you can have uh, dysfunction, but not have any plantar fasciitis or any other foot conditions. Does that make sense? So what are some of the things that can cause dysfunction? So uh, having a flat foot, that can cause dysfunction in your foot, making the tendons have to work more, the, the plantar fascia. Having a flatter foot or a pronated foot, not being as active. So sitting around a lot, being, 
being very inactive, having a sitting job, sitting all the time versus standing. Uh, that's one of the worst things that we can do for our kids is putting them sitting in desks all the time and not being active uh, or being overactive. Let's say someone is, is doing a lot of activity and things just kind of wear out that wear out over time or get stressed and you injure one area and you compensate. Uh, having tightness, this is one of the most common ones that we see, having tightness in the back of the calf or in other parts of your body. Uh, improper shoes, shoes that are old or inserts that are old. Uh, having a foot deformity, there's multiple types of foot deformities that can develop plantar fasciitis. The most common ones are flatter foot, a flat foot, but it can also be happening in someone with a high arched foot as well. And then any other type of deformity of your foot and then impact. So impact, all these things can cause dysfunction and you might go over the symptom line. So you might live your whole life without having any symptoms of plantar fasciitis. That's how many of people are. Um, I find a lot of patients, they go up into the symptom line and then they'll stay in the symptom line until we can change some of these things that are causing dysfunction. So we're going to try to revert some of these things that are causing dysfunction to help them get out of the symptom line. But then we see some patients, they get into the symptom, they try some, maybe some home therapies, they go out of the symptom line, and then it happens again, they get more symptoms, and it kind of goes back and forth. If that's your case, if it keeps coming and going and you're not getting better, that's where I think it's important to, to seek out help. But that, that's the understanding of the symptom dysfunction index. Um, so what are some of the common questions? I'm going to go over a lot of questions in this presentation. And if you have other ones, please write them underneath it. And I'll try to be uh, comprehensive and explain those. So why does my foot hurt even if I didn't injure it? That's why I use that dysfunction symptom index, what I just showed you. It, it might not hurt because you, you didn't really injure it. You didn't jump on it, but you you're just have some dysfunction going on in your body. Why do you only have pain in one foot? So you have one foot uh, is dysfunctional and the other one isn't. Well, sometimes, sometimes people are right foot dominant. Um, but thankfully, uh, plantar fasciitis isn't uh, in both foot, feet normally. Occasionally it is, but many times it, it isn't. So thankfully for that. Um, why I don't have any real great rhyme or reason why one is more painful than the other. Um, why did it go away in the past and come back? Well, once again, if you don't treat the underlying symptoms, so what can happen is you can have it and then you do some stretching and then it goes away or you buy a shoe insert or get a new shoe and it goes away and then it comes back. It's because you're really not dealing with the things that are causing this, and also the tissue that's changing. Uh, how long will it take to get better? That's a good question. Uh, I have patients that have had it for a couple of weeks and they get better on their own. I've had patients that have had it for years and, and they don't get better and they need surgery. It really depends. I find the longer you have it though, before you seek treatment, the longer it takes to get better. So um, we try to get patients better as quick as possible. That's why we, we throw uh, all types of treatments at them, the traditional treatments and the regenerative treatments uh, to get them better quick as possible because most people don't like to live with plantar fasciitis. What are the most common uh, diagnostic exams that we do? Well, the, the first one that you probably have at a doctor's office is something called an x-ray. So an x-ray, you're gonna look, you're gonna look at the bone architecture. Most of the times what they look at is the heel spur, if there's a heel spur. Now, as I mentioned before, a heel spur isn't the problem. We don't treat heel spurs. We used to remove them. We don't really remove them much anymore unless maybe we're doing a surgery or cutting through the fascia. But for the most part, we the, the spur only indicates that there's been tightness there for a long, long time. Uh, I would recommend when you're getting x-rays as we do in the office, this is not one of those. This is a non-weight bearing x-ray. You're gonna want a, an x-ray where your foot is actually standing up so you can see how your foot works, you know, what we call the mechanics of your foot to see if you have a very flat foot or a high arched foot. Uh, what I find more beneficial though, is this. This is an example of an ultrasound. Uh, an ultrasound, it, it kind of looks like bad black and white TV. Uh, this is an example of a foot that's upside down. So if you took this foot and flipped it over, this is the heel region. And this is, these are the toes out here. And this is uh, the left one and the right one. So you can see on the right one here, the distance between the two A's, uh, it's not that thick and it's thicker here on the, left, on the left side, the distance between the two A's. The other thing you can notice is that it's darker on this side. And it's, it looks, this looks the same as the other tissue. So if you're looking at an ultrasound, it looks the same as the other tissue. There's probably not much inflammation and there's not much thickness of it. If you look at this one, it's going to be, it's inflamed. And that's what the water looks like, or the inflammation it looks black on an ultrasound. And it also looks thicker. Now, one thing we have to realize is if you've had plantar fasciitis for a long period of time, the tissue tends to change. As I mentioned, the fascia doesn't heal all that well because it doesn't have the best blood supply. Actually, I don't think I mentioned that before. One of the big challenges is muscles have good blood supply, but tendons and ligaments and fascia, they don't. And that's why they take so much longer to heal because they don't have the best blood supply. And that's where most of our focus on these regenerative treatments or these, these types of treatments that physical therapy do and other people do is to increase the blood flow to the area. 
to help that. This is something called fasciosis, which is an actual thickness, uh, thickening, almost like a scarring. If you can think of scarring of tissue, it gets thicker and it get, then it gets inflamed and then it doesn't move as well. It gets even tighter and it's kind of a vicious circle that way. So I find that an ultrasound is really beneficial to help me uh, guide in the treatments. Uh, here are some questions that patients ask me. Um, why is an ultrasound better than an x-ray? I kind of mentioned that. I think an ultrasound shows more of the tissue. Uh, an x-ray is okay if you're considering a stress fracture or looking at a spur. We do that anyway to see how the mechanics of your foot is, but I find an ultrasound better because it shows more of the soft tissue versus the x-ray, which shows the bone. Uh, the benefit of the MRI is it shows bone and soft tissue, and inside of the bone, it shows if there are any stress fractures, if there's what we call uh, bone marrow edema, which is just swelling inside of the bone, uh, other types of uh, conditions that can be mistaken for plantar fasciitis if it's not getting better. Um, some of my patients ask me, in, in, in why, don't, why doesn't insurance cover ultrasound at times? We find that some insurances do cover, but some do not. It might, it might be more so based on our specialty because there are certain um, requirements for reading MRIs, reading ultrasounds, uh, and, and we can do them. We do them in the office, but sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. It might be more of a specialty uh, issue. But if we're doing an ultrasound, we, we many times will do it with an ultrasound guided procedure of something, whether it be cortisone, whether it be an amniotic stem cell injection, uh, you know, something else like that. And I do think it's very valuable and it's not worth it to go somewhere else, have them look at it because we're, we're doing it many times during the course of our treatments. Um, what can be seen in an ultrasound? An ultrasound shows soft tissue. So it shows the fascia. It, you can see the cortex of the bone. Uh, you can see, I, if you're really good at it, you can look at uh, other types of metatarsal stress fractures. You can look at soft tissue masses and other types of things like that. Um, does an ultrasound have to be done? It doesn't always have to be. And I worked many years without an ultrasound, but it's a lot easier if you do have an ultrasound. Specifically, you can show before and after. And one thing I would recommend if you're seeing a doctor, ask them to show you the x-rays and the ultrasound and take a picture with your phone. So you can kind of compare it. You can, I, you can, I kind of joke, you can put it on the fridge if you want to look at your heel spur or you want to look at your, your heel. But you can, then you can see if it's getting better and the, doc, and the doctor should be able to show you based on the ultrasound if it is getting better, if it's getting less thick, if it's less black in there. Uh, um, why is an ultrasound recommended before shockwave therapy and cortisone injections? Uh, I, in my practice, I like to do an ultrasound before them First of all, for the shockwave, so I can show you how thick it is, and that would be called fasciosis, and shockwave works really well at reducing that fasciosis, which is a, a thickening of the fascia. For cortisone injection specifically, I can get it right in the, the thickest spot, the most inflamed spot. It's just a lot easier to do it versus shooting blind. Um, I've kind of gotten addicted to doing it with ultrasound. I did it for many years without it, but I think it just makes it easier. And for patients, it's easier for them to understand the condition using an ultrasound. Um, here's an example of an ultrasound on the bottom of the foot. Uh, this is a, a probe that we use and we, put, and we can see it. Um, here are uh, another couple of other exams that we do here. Uh, this is an, an MRI. You can see here, it's kind of showing the thickness and inflammation around the fascia. And this is something that's called a bone scan. You can see there's some uptake in the heel region. And this, if you're unsure of an ultrasound or an x-ray, and maybe you don't have access to an MRI, uh, you might be able to get a bone scan to see if there's some uptake in the heel, which might indicate a stress fracture in the heel. Um, when do I need an ultrasound? I recommend uh, doing an ultrasound at the first or the second visit. What I'll do for a lot of my patients, I'll get an x-ray the first visit. And if I have time, I'll do an ultrasound that'll help guide me if I'm going to do more of like a cortisone injection or if I'm going to do more uh, shockwave. Uh, I specifically do it before I do shockwave treatment and we'll get into shockwave in a little bit, what that is. And um, I think it helps me and I do it before and after. So I'll do it before the treatments. I'll do the three to six treatments and then I'll see you six weeks after and I'll do another one and we can compare the tissue. It also works for other types of tissue that's been in other tendons and ligaments and things like that. Uh, when is an MRI needed or a bone scan? I find that those are needed if it's not getting better, uh, like I would suspect, let's say I do some traditional treatments, put you, whatever it be, put you in a walking boot, give you a cortisone injection, or if we do the regenerative stuff, which is doing shockwave and amnio, and you're not getting better as I would suspect, then I would do an MRI, or if I'm concerned uh, having a, a stress fracture uh, or a, something else in the, in, the, in the bone. There are some, a couple of other clinical exams I'd like to show you that your doctor might do. Um, these, uh, this is one where you dorsiflex or lift up on the big toe joint uh, and the big toe and you push in there. And if, if it hurts in there, that's kind of a good indicator of uh, plantar fasciitis, or it can also be an indicator of something called flexor hallucis tenosynovitis, which is a pain to this tendon that pulls down the big toe. Um, if you squeeze the heel, this is an example, you can't see the thumb, but the thumb would be squeezed 
recognizing it, that's a good indicator if someone has either um, Baxter's neuritis or a stress fracture in the heel. And also if you tap on the side and there's shooting pain, that could be a good indicator on the inside of the ankle of a, of a nerve entrapment. Okay, that, that could happen as well. So we're not gonna go into all those other ones, but those are some other exams that your doctor might wanna do. So this is what I use every single day in my practice and I put it together. It's called the plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator. Um, I'm gonna go through all of these one by one, but I just wanna quickly introduce this. This is the way I explain it to patients. And if you came into the office, this is what I would, this is, these are actually almost the same slides I would show you. And, uh, and this is the last one. This is the last one where I'll talk about you know, the effectiveness scale, there are certain things that are most effective and others that are least effective, okay? And I wanna do, and I put this together so I can show you what's most effective and, you know, you can decide what you would like to do as a patient. Um, a simple way to explain it is most people try the stuff below the yellow line before they come and see me. And that would mean you're, most people are trying anti-inflammatories, they're trying stretching, they're trying over-the-counter arch supports, they're trying icing, maybe a contrast bath. If you don't know what that is, we'll talk about it. A little bit. They might try taping their foot. They might try a compression sleeve, topical pain reducing creams like Voltaren gel or Biofreeze or, or um, the CSC, this, uh, the hemp type of stuff uh, that they're doing now. They might try losing weight. They might think if I lose enough weight, it'll make it go away. So if you've tried these things before you see your doctor and you're not getting better after a period of time, then you should go see the doctor. There's stuff under the yellow line. So kind of remember the yellow line. And then when someone comes in, that's when I'm going to do the stuff above the yellow line, okay? So we're gonna do what's, what's most effective. Now, some people have told me I should change the red to a different color. If you have a different color, I should put, let me know, but the red seems to work well because they say, well, red means stop, but I'm just still doing it. So the, the most effective things are cortisone or shockwave in my opinion. And the thing I didn't mention, there are different types of uh, pillars for treating plantar fasciitis. I kind of call these pillars. There's three different pillars. Uh, one is to reduce the pain. One is to reduce the tightness and one is to reduce the stress kind of stresses going through your foot. And uh, to reduce the pain, I find most effective if your pain is an eight, nine or a 10 on a 10 scale, doing a cortisone injection. But most patients aren't that bad. But if you're in a lot of pain, I'll put you in a cortisone and I'll put you in a walking boot, okay? Uh, but most of my patients, it's not that bad. And so I'm tending to do shockwave therapy and we're gonna go into a lot of depth what shock, shockwave, give, shockwave is. And then if on the ultrasound, I see an area of a tear or another focal, or just a kind of a focused area, I might do an anime injection in there. So that's how I help with reducing pain, okay? We'll talk about all the, the treatments. It's usually between three and six sessions. Uh, the next would be reducing tightness. Uh, I find patients usually try stretching. They might even try night splint. They buy on Amazon or something. Uh, and then by the time, and then trying some home stretching and things like that, like home, but I usually recommend some home therapy with foam rolling and we'll go over that. And then I'll also recommend physical therapy for most of my patients. I just find patients better faster with physical therapy. People try to do it on their own and they're just not that motivated. Uh, so I recommend doing it on your own and in physical therapy. And then to reduce the stress, uh, a walking boot, there's something called an ankle foot orthotic. And I'll show you about that. Occasionally we'll do this for long standing plantar fasciitis. Uh, there are some sandals I like, specifically called the UFO sandals. Uh, there's a lot of appropriate shoes. Uh, there is a, a shoe buying guide I'll, I'll put underneath this video. Uh, and you can get it at uh, drpelto.com slash, I believe it's shoe or shoes or something like that, shoe. And then there is um, a custom orthotics. We'll, we'll kind of go into that in more detail. Okay. So this is normally where I stop. That's why I have this black slide, but I'm going to keep going here for you. Uh, so let's let's talk about a few of the things uh, about plantar fasciitis. If you want to learn more uh, about it, so why should I? What should I avoid when I have plantar fasciitis? These are some of the main things I tell my patients to avoid. You should avoid going barefoot. So barefoot, uh, not forever, just for now, and avoid wearing really unsupportive flat flat shoes. Uh, those types of things aren't going to be very good. Flats, ballerina slippers, going barefoot, things like that. For now, not forever. Um, people not foam rolling or stretching. Uh, people, they just kind of think they want to come to see the doctor and I'll, I'll give them a shot and make it all go away. There is some stuff that needs to be done by you, especially for loosening up that tightness. So if they're not doing any of that, you're not going to see as much progress. If you're still walking or standing a lot and it's really painful, that's going to, that, that's, you should avoid. So if it's really hurting, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. If you're limping, you shouldn't be doing it. You should find a way to take pressure off that foot. And then the, the last thing is avoid 
like waiting to see a doctor too long. This is the biggest challenge is people come in and their tissues have already changed. And I can see that on an ultrasound because I've waited such a long time. So I would recommend seeing someone uh, sooner versus later. Uh, what are the most common misconceptions uh, about plantar fasciitis? People come in and they always say, hey, doctor, is it because I'm overweight? I'm fat. Is that why I have it? No, that's not the reason. I see people that are overweight. I see skinny people. I see a lot of different people. It's not usually weight that does it. Um, second misconception is it'll go away if I give it enough time. Uh, that's also not true. Uh, if it goes away, that's great. Your symptoms go away, but you didn't really uh, fix the underlying issue. So giving it time isn't sometimes just enough. Um, icing in a water bottle, icing with a water bottle and stretching is enough. Those are the things that people see online. If you Google plantar fasciitis, and I hope this is going to be much more than, than that for you, but if that doesn't work, like that's not everything. You haven't really tried much. People come in, they say, well, I stretched, I've got new shoes and I've done a water bottle. Uh, I've done everything I can do. Well, that's not everything. There's a lot of other things. Um, there is a shoe that will fix my problem. This is a common misconception. Uh, and many patients spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And they just say, doctor, just what's the shoe that'll make me better. There's not one shoe. I want to be clear. It's not the ones that they advertise that have orthotics in them. It's not, I'm not going to talk about other names. It's there's no well, plantar fasciitis shoe. They say there is for marketing purposes, but there's not one shoe. Okay. The shoe won't fix it. It's a combination of things. Um, I'll have to get a cortisone injection. Uh, that's not true either. There are many treatments without doing cortisone. Uh, and like I talked about, there's some regenerative treatments and things like that that can be done. And my heel pain will never go away. That's not the truth. It will go away. You just haven't had enough treatment or the proper treatment yet. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes when treating plantar fasciitis at home? See, these are the things that I see from patients. Uh, they're waiting too long before they're, they're uh, seeing, they're seeking, sorry, that's a seeking before seeking out help. This is the biggest thing is patients just wait too long. I don't know if it's because high co-pays or because they're thinking it's going to go away on its own, or they, there's so much abundant information online that people can read up, but you, you shouldn't wait before seeking out. Um, thinking another shoe or shoe insert will fit my prop, fix my problem. That's what I find. They just try one other shoe. They try one other insert. They try this, this magic um, sandal that they can get. They, they try this magic splint that they can get. And it's not usually one thing. If it's one thing, you wouldn't be watching this video this far. And uh, you probably wouldn't be uh, trying to see a doctor. Um, having the incorrect diagnosis, that's where it's important to find the right type of doctor that deals with plantar fasciitis a lot. Um, you need to be diagnosed because you might diagnose it wrong. Some people think they have heel pain or plantar fasciitis and they really have Achilles tendonitis. They may have a stress fracture. They might have a bone. Uh, another bone issue going on. They might have a plantar fascial tear. There's a lot of other things that can happen. Uh, and another common mistake is wearing improper or no shoes. So no shoes are bad, but there are improper shoes. So people tend to wear the oldest shoes or they wear um, slippers at home and other things are flip-flops, things like that. They don't offer any support. And then um, no, lo not loosening, sorry, another typo here, <laughs> not loosening the calf properly. So those are some, some other things that can, that can cause it. Okay. Um, and then what are some common mistakes when treating plantar fasciitis by a doctor? So these are mistakes that I have made and that I've seen others make uh, when I see second opinions, um, helping the pain, but not the underlying problem. As I mentioned before, there are symptoms that can happen and there are certain kind of causes or underlying causes. So you have to fix the underlying cause. If you just do a cortisone injection and you don't fix the flat foot, or at least do an orthotic for the flat foot or fix the tightness, it tends to come back. Failing to address equinus, which is a tightness. This is the biggest thing that people fail to address. They just think a little stretching is gonna be enough. And it usually takes more than that. Uh, failing to recommend a combination of treatment. That's why I have those three pillars I talked about. I recommend a combination of treatment is the best way to, to get better faster. Um, once again, an incorrect diagnosis. It could be some of these other things that I mentioned as well, uh, Baxter's neuritis, it could be a bursa. Uh, it could be um, other things like a plantar fascial tear, uh, incomplete imaging and not getting an ultrasound or an MRI. So some people don't get any x-rays. I, I, everyone should get an x-ray, I, I believe. Um, and then an ultrasound, they might not have an ultrasound and they might not have access to an MRI due to insurance issues. But I think an ultrasound and MRI is going to really help. And then uh, not including regenerative treatments. I, I really wouldn't know how to practice right now without regenerative treatments. It, it's just made my practice so much easier to get patients better faster. Uh, what I say with regenerative treatment, it gets you better about 50% faster and it's about 80% effective. So that's why I like to do the, the, and those are like the shockwave and the amnia we're gonna talk about. So let's go in and, and answer some questions that people have about home treatments for plantar fasciitis. Now, these are the things that you would try initially. Um, first of all, people ask me, how long should I try home treatments first? Uh, you can try it two weeks, you can try it four weeks, 
two months, that's fine. But if it's not getting better after a couple months, I would see someone. Um, and what can I believe on regarding online treatments? Well, um, if you're watching this, you probably looked at other videos, uh, but you have to be careful what you're watching and who's talking uh, about it and what they're saying and if they're trying to sell something. Uh, those are the kind of the things I would be wary of if they're, they're saying this magic shoe is going to make it better, this magic splint. It's not a, a one-shot deal, okay? So you have to be careful what they're saying. So first of all, reducing inflammation with anti-inflammatories. A few questions that patients have. Um, how long can I take NSAIDs? Uh, once again, this is up to your doctor. If you don't have any other uh, issues, uh, I usually have patients take it, try it for two weeks, okay? I do it two weeks. Um, I tend to do it, uh, if it causes any stomach problems, I'll take it with food or have them take it with food. Uh, and uh, with, I don't like to go more than two weeks because you're just masking it, right? If it's, you can't take abundant amounts of anti-inflammatories. What I mean by that is like Motrin, ibuprofen, naproxen, uh, things like that. Um, you can't take abundant and that, that's going to cause your stomach issues. And it's just, it's, you're going to, you're hurting and you're walking and you're limping and it's hurting and you're taking more of it. It's kind of like if you're, if your head hurts, you have a headache and you're hitting the wall and you're taking like Tylenol to make your head, head, head pain, headache, headache pain go away. It's not going to work because you're constantly hitting it. So people are constantly hitting their foot and walking and being active and the anti-inflammatories aren't going to work. So if after two weeks, you're not getting better, you should probably see someone two weeks of taking anti-inflammatories. Uh, is prednisone a good option? Occasionally, someone has a really painful inflamed plantar fascia. I'll do a short dose called a Medrol dose pack of plantar uh, of prednisone. Um, can I take over the counter or do I need a prescription? I usually do over the counter. Most of my patients, I recommend two Aleve twice a day for two weeks. So two Aleve twice a day, two weeks. Aleves are usually 220 milligrams. So which is the same as naproxen, which is about the same, which is 500 and 500 milligrams. You do that. Uh, I like Aleve. The reason I like it is because it's twice a day dosing. So morning and night. So I have people get in this routine of getting up in the morning, foam rolling in the morning and at night taking anti-inflammatory in the morning and at night uh, with um, Motrin or, or ibuprofen, there's three, three times a day dosing and most people forget the middle dose. Uh, let's talk about um, reducing inflammation with icing and contrast baths. Uh, this is an example of a contrast bath. So there's a, a hot bucket here and a cold bucket here. So you always start and stop on the hot. So five, I'm sorry, I just said it wrong. Start and stop on the cold. So cold for five minutes, hot for five minutes and then cold for five minutes. And um, here's kind of a unique way you might be able to stretch while you're, while you're inside of the, the little tub of your ice water. Um, some people like the, the, the frozen water bottle method and others prefer like a, a Dixie cup or a cup and they pull off the, 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 the paper or the styrofoam and they can ice it that way. So there's a lot of different ways you can ice it. Um, a lot of patients like this contrast, which is five minutes in ice, five minutes in hot, five minutes in ice. It kind of resets your computer. That's what I say. It's kind of, it kind of shocks your body a little bit. Um, if you want to, I have some uh, healthy other videos talking about this, this ice and cold baths and other types of things like that, that I kind of like to do. So um, how long should you ice? Uh, I would say 10 minutes is fine. Don't burn your skin. You can, if, if it goes directly ice on it, you might want to put a towel or something. What's the best way to ice? Uh, the best way is whatever way you're going to be consistent doing. Okay. If it's going to be a bag of peas in the freezer that you're going to pull out and put your foot on it, that's fine. Uh, but I would just be consistent if you can do it twice a day. Okay. Um, what's a contrast bath? That's what I said. It's ice water. Dink, duck your whole foot in there. Ice, uh, heat, and then ice again. When should you use heat? Um, I don't use heat that much for plantar fasciitis unless I'm concerned about a nerve issue. If there's a, like a nerve entrapment, sometimes nerve uh, can respond better to loosening of the tissues. And heat can actually use on, it work better on the, on the back of the calf with the tightness of the muscles. That's when that works. Let's talk about reducing the tightness. So tightness is a big component. Uh, tightness, specifically Aquinas, uh, is a really big thing. I'm not going to go deep into Aquinas, but when you lift up your foot, and you can't just do this with your with your like sticking your foot out like I'm doing right now and trying to lift it up. You really have to have someone evaluate for Aquinas if you have tightness. Your foot should get past neutral, meaning get past like as it's flat on the ground up to 20 degrees. If it doesn't, then you probably have tightness or Aquinas. And that's real common in society today because we're sitting all down all the time. So what are the ways of treating it? You can do stretching, um, but most people can get stretching exercises online. So I don't spend that much time talking about stretching. I like deep tissue massage. So you're going to see a couple of things. These are called trigger point tools where they really go deep into the back of the calf and you roll this little ball back and forth on this yoga block. This is a foam roller, another way of doing that. Now, uh, word of the wise, most of my patients cannot do this plank. So you have to modify accordingly, okay, how to do this. But if you go to drpelter.com slash heel, um, I have some different videos and uh, things and teaching you how to do this. And this is a stick foam roller. So whatever you like, whatever you have, you can use. These aren't magic. 
And this is an example of a ball similar to this, but it's bigger. So you roll it back and forth and you can use this on the back of your calf. You can use this on other parts of your body as well. I think I'm a big believer in foam rolling because it increases uh, blood flow to the tissue and it helps to loosen things up. Um, what's the best way to develop a stretching habit? I, I believe there's a good book I like called um, Atomic Habits. And you have, to, um, you have to stack it on something else that you already do. So that's what I would say. So if you already get up in the morning and you have your foam roller by your bed and it's right in front of the door when you go to the bathroom, you're gonna use it right before you get up, or right when you get up and then right at the end of the day. That's the best way is to stack it onto something else that you already do. If you have it sitting in a closet, you're not gonna do it. So putting it out in your living room as well. So if you're gonna do it at the end of the day, um, have it there so you can do it. What's the best type of stretching? Um, I find the best is the one that you're going to do. Okay. I don't like stretching that much. Occasionally you can stretch, like putting your heel down on the stairs, be careful if you do it correctly or the runner stretch. But I find the best type is foam rolling because it, 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 uh, it doesn't put strain on the tendon itself or on the fascia itself. How long do I need to stretch? And is more better. I have some people, they try to stretch for hours and hours. You can't really do that. Uh, you know, if you can do 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night, I think that is good. Um, there's also something called a night splint that we'll talk about that if you can wear that for three hours or so at a stint, that's good. Um, what can I do wrong with stretching? Well, if you stretch too much, you can actually injure yourself. Or if you stretch improperly, you're really not getting a good, a good stretch. Okay. Um, there are some of these high fangle inventions that they make um, where they do like these I don't know, vibrations and pulses and things like that. These are kind of cool. Uh, these aren't to replace some of the regenerative treatments, but if you have someone that'll do this for you, um, that's kind of, it's an easier way of doing it. There's also a foam roller that has a vibration in it. Um, is a foam roller better or a massage tool? I find foam roller is the best. There are different um, massage tools that you can use, but I think the foam roller is better. It's cheaper uh, than these big tools. Why are there so many ways to perform deep tissue massage? Well, there's so many ways because I think there's so many different companies that want to sell things. So if you look up deep tissue massage tools, there's tons of them. Um, I would just say get whatever's the most common, get one that's popular online. I guess you could do that. One that you'll use. Okay, I like the shorter ones versus the really, really big ones. That's my opinion. And which one should I buy? You know, pick the, pick the best one for you, okay? This is an example of one that's electronic. So you plug it in, it's kind of cool and it vibrates for you. So you don't have to roll it back and forth as much. And there's just like different ones I, I like to show different people. So let's talk now about um, reducing tightness and morning pain. So this specifically is if you have pain getting out of bed in the morning uh, or if when you sit down and get up, it hurts. Um, it's usually due to tightness. My main go-to is called my morning routine. And my morning routine is you stretch for three minutes like this with a towel or a belt three minutes each foot that hurts uh, before you get out of bed. And then you get up and then you foam roll. You use like a foam roller thingy, one of these things. That's what my morning routine is for my patients. Um, if you want to get something higher tech, I guess you could try this, something called the Strasbourg sock, which pulls your toes back. Some people get numbness in the toes because of this and they, they hate it. Um, there are two different types of night splints. One's called the posterior, which is the back of the calf and one's in the front. Um, and you wear that, if you can wear it all night, you are a champion. It comes in a nice romantic gray color or a blue color. Uh, and uh, most people can't wear it all night. So they'll pull it off in the middle of the night because your foot's going down or they just don't like it. So if you can watch it when you're, when you, can you wear it when you're watching TV at the end of the day, that's an okay option as well. Some questions. Um, why do I uh, have pain getting out of bed in the morning? Once again, I believe it's due to the tightness. So everything kind of gets tight. And that's why the stretching and the deep tissue massage works well. Um, why do I need to do a morning routine? I think the morning routine is the best way to reduce that morning pain that you have. If you don't have any morning pain and you don't have any equinus or tightness, then you might not need to do that. But I, most of my patients do it. Uh, when is a night splint preferred? It's preferred if you have pain getting out of bed in the morning and you can wear it at night. That's when it's preferred. Or if you, I kind of consider it the lazy man's way. So if you, if you can do a foam roller. I think that's better jumping out of bed, doing foam rolling, but a lot of people like night splints. Um, and also it's covered by insurance for many insurances. When would I use a Strasbourg sock? Well, if you don't like the night splint and you still want to do something, you could try the sock. Um, and how long do I need to wear it? I usually say three hours. If you can wear it, wear it three hours when you're watching TV at the end of the day, or if you can last three hours at night, that's fine. Um, something else, I talk about different sandals. There are many sandals. I don't want to um, advertise any one sandal, but I recommend a sandal with a good arch support in it that you're going to feel comfortable wearing around the house. So getting out of bed, putting a sandal on. Um, why can't I go barefoot? 
or wear slippers. I just find a sandal has a nice arch support, has good cushion. Um, why are flip-flops not recommended? They're really flat flip-flops. They don't give you any arch support and they don't have any cushion. I like personally like UFOs. Um, I just think they have a good arch support and those are the ones I use. There are other brands though that are coming out that are very similar. They're the cute, there are some cuter ones for females that like to wear the cute ones, but I find UFOs and I, I got bought a pair for my mom. So, you know, if they're, they're good, if you buy a pair for my mom and, and, and now, now what she does, cause I'm from Minnesota, if you guys don't know, and I live in, in Massachusetts. So if you want to see me, you can come see me. I'm in Worcester and Westboro. But um, my mom, she always says now, uh, hey, Don, I need a new pair of uh, UFOs. And, and I buy them for her. And then she says, oh, I'll reimburse you. And I said, yeah, don't worry, mom. So she has, she, every, she has like every single type now of UFO. And then she got the UFO shoes and everything else like that. I'm not, I don't make anything on UFOs, uh, but that's the one I bought for her. Uh, let's talk a little bit about socks. Uh, there are different types of socks. These are compression socks. Uh, they have different compressions at different areas on the sock. This is just one type. There are multiple types. Uh, this will help if there's swelling and if you feel better with taping. I don't like to tape because it takes time. And I like these compression socks instead, instead because you don't have to tape every day. You can just put the sock on. So some people like them. Some people hate them. Okay. But that's just another example. Um, what does compression do to help my foot pain? It, it, it almost like tapes it and holds everything together. It just makes it feel better. Is compression better or taping? I like compression more than taping just because I'm lazy and I don't like to tape the bottom of the foot. That's why some people go to the physical therapist and they'll tape them and it lasts two or three days. But I think it's kind of grungy because you have to shower with it or not shower. Uh, can I sleep with a compression sleeve? You're not supposed to. You're supposed to take it off. What millimeters of mercury should I use? There's not really, there's just to get a compression sleeve. That's the one I would get that one that goes just the heel. It's not, um, it's like 15 to 30. I think that's what it is. The ones that you buy that way. Uh, we could talk, this is an example of the strapping or the taping that you can do. Uh, actually, I think this is, yeah, this is a type of that. This might be an Una boot, but here are some over-the-counter inserts and here's just a type of a shoe. I'm not, once again, advertising any shoes. This is just an example of a stable shoe and over-the-counter type of insert. Um, I wanna answer some questions that patients ask me. What's the best shoe for my foot pain? There's not one great shoe. Okay. You want to have a new shoe that's over, not, not older than six months old. And I recommend a good shoe from a running store. Don't go to like El Cheapo store where you can get them for $20. Don't do that. Get a, you're probably looking at spending hundred, hundred and twenty dollars for a good shoe. Okay. Good athletic shoe, running shoe. Even though I don't run, I only walk still get a running shoe. Don't get a cross trainer. Just get a running because it has better cushion. What's the best over the counter insert and how do I choose? There are thousands of inserts out there. I like one that's more rigid. That's how I would choose it. Don't get one that flattens out when you push on it. Don't get one that's just gel. You want to get something more rigid. Uh, my favorite one, which I showed you here, is called a Walk Hero. It's $20 on Amazon. Once again, I, I don't make anything off of that, but that's just the one that I recommend. It's cheap. Um, but I, 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 most of my patients get custom orthotics because those only last about two to three months. Okay. Is taping helpful for my foot pain? It can be helpful. It's kind of hard to put on. You can try to do it yourself, but it usually helps if someone does it on your own. Uh, can I tape on my own? You can try to do it. Uh, if you have a good video, uh, make it and share it with me and I'll share it with everyone. Uh, what is KT taping and is it helpful? So KT tape is called kinesio tape. It's a type of tape that has some stretch to it and you can put it on the foot and it can kind of hold up the arch of the foot. It lasts for a number of days and it helps uh, stimulate blood flow uh, as well to the area. So it's helpful. Usually that's done by a physical therapist. Okay, now we're going into phase three, the final phase. I know this is like the world's longest video here on heel pain. Now, now we're gonna go into the doctor treatments. So kind of bear with me, okay? So doctor specific treatments. These are things that you're, you can't do on your own. So when should I consider seeing a doctor? This is a big question. Um, once again, if you're taking anti-inflammatories for two weeks and you're not any better, you've stretched, you've iced, it's not getting better, I would see someone. I don't know when that's gonna be. Uh, if stretching makes it go, get it go away, you don't need to see anyone. If it goes away, you don't need to see anyone. But if it's not getting better, let's say two to four weeks, you should see a doctor. What type of doctor should I see? Primary care, chiropractic, physical therapist, orthopedist, or a podiatrist. So I'm a podiatrist. I would say go see a podiatrist. But I'm just joking. Uh, what I would see is I would, see, I would see the doctor that sees it the most. See the doctor that sees it the most. Okay. So I, you know, we see, I would say five times a day, plantar fasciitis every single day for the last 15 years. So we see a lot of it. So if your primary care sees a lot of it, that's great. Physical therapist could try those, but I would see uh, who sees it the most. Why can't I just try what I see online? You can, and both people do, and you can ask your friends, but no two patients are the same. And if you're not getting better, I would see someone. So let's talk a little bit about shockwave. 
So shockwave is a regenerative treatment that I do. There's something called focused shockwave and something else called radial shockwave. So the main difference is radial, um, you, you shoot the waves out and it goes outward like this in a bigger surface area. That's radial shockwave. Focus shockwave goes right in. So you, this is the area that hurts you on your foot and you stay right on that area. This, you go kind of all around it. Um, this one has like a bullet that goes back and forth and it causes radial shockwave. So they're generated, um, this is by electricity and this is by this little, little bullet that goes back and forth here. Uh, how does it work? It works through mechanical transduction. Uh, and so it actually injures the tissue and helps your body to heal itself. Um, when should I consider it? Well, it really depends. If you're not getting better with your home treatments and if you see someone and on the ultrasound there is thickness, I would recommend doing it. Um, the problems are it's operator dependent. So not all doctors are, are doing a lot of this. You'd want someone that just doesn't do it just every once in a while. Same thing about getting a doctor to treat you. You want someone that treats this a lot. And uh, we'd like to use kind of a, a lawn care analogy uh, that if, um, if you have bad portion of lawn, right, what you do is you make little holes in it and then you throw seeds in it. And that's how you get it to grow. So what this does by hitting it, it injures it. And then it can, the blood flow can go in there and, and make it kind of heal. That's kind of the lawn, lawn care analogy. Um, when would shockwave be appropriate for me? I would say most patients that by the time they come and see me, I do shockwave on them. That it's just the most effective regenerative way. It speeds up the treatment by about 50%. And I think it's about 80% effective. Ultrasound is very helpful because it'll show me how thick the fascia is. If it's very thick, then it's pretty much a, a guarantee that the, uh, the, the shockwave will be beneficial. Does it speed up healing? Yes, I think it speeds up by about 50%. Um, is it dangerous? No, not dangerous at all. That's the benefit. It doesn't cause any harm. Might might be a little tender when you're doing it. it doesn't cause any harm. Um, you can't do it uh, specifically. You can't do the fo the focused if you have on a blood thinner, and you know, and if you, you probably wouldn't want to do it on a couple of if you have like cancer in that area and things like that. Um, who should not have it? Like I said, people that have cancer and people that have a history of a blood clot uh, specifically you wouldn't want to do the focused one. Is it painful? It's not really painful. You're going to feel it. You're supposed to feel it. It's kind of like going to the gym. You're going to be a little tender afterwards. And the treatments, there's usually between three and six treatments. I'll explain that a little bit, a little bit more. This is the way I kind of explain it to patients is if you have a pain, your pain's five, five to an eight, I would recommend the shockwave and based on the ultrasound. Um, if your pain is like a nine or a 10, I'll do a, a cortisone injection. So I made this to kind of help you guys understand a little bit of what, what the pro process is. So initially what happens is we do an evaluation uh, to determine if you qualify for it. And this is usually with the ultrasound and then based on the previous treatments up to that point. So if you come in and you've had other treatments, um, I'll probably go right to the shockwave. If you haven't tried icing, anti-inflammatory, stretching, I'll probably try that first. Uh, then patients do between three and six sessions. They're done weekly in the office. You can go up to every two weeks, but I usually do them weekly. It's kind of like going to the gym. You don't want to go to the gym just once a month. You're not going to see any benefit. You'd like to do it more frequently. Um, sessions take about seven to 10 minutes for each treatment area. Sometimes I'll do the Achilles and the plantar fascia. Uh, sometimes I'll do different spots or different, two different feet. Um, sometimes there can be more than one area. You want to avoid anti-inflammatories two days before and two days after. That's the one thing you can't do because that'll, you want to create an inflammatory response. Uh, and then uh, at six weeks, after you finish those sessions, then I see you six weeks after there's an interval of six weeks during this interval, uh, what's going to happen is your body is going to be repairing the injured tissue. And this, this starts at six weeks, but it'll continue for three to four months. That's the key. It's not quick. Okay. It takes a long time for your body to repair itself. But during this period, this is where most of my patients go to their six weeks of physical therapy. Then after they finish that, then I do a post shockwave evaluation we're going to evaluate your improvement via an exam and the ultrasound. And then based on the improvement, we're going to recommend either more sessions or other types of treatments. Uh, and then there's a four month interval. So this, this is the time, let's say you're feeling good at six weeks. We don't need to do anything else. This four, four month interval is when your body continues to repair and remodel the tissue for another four months. And there's going to be, you're going to do your other treatments at that time. So that's the, the shockwave process. I do this pretty much every single day in, in, in our offices. Okay. Um, there are a lot of technical terms of what it does. It, it stimulates microcirculation, which is blood and lymph. It produces a metabolism of nitrous oxide, vasodilation, which opens up blood vessels, reductive, uh, reduction of oxidative stress, mechanical transduction, which is, means injures the cell and then it increases the, the cell wall permeability. So the cells kind of, they kind of work better, uh, producing substance P, right? Which, uh, which takes away pain. 
um, anti-inflammatory effects, um, producing growth factors, specifically the focused is going to produce it in the, in the bone. So you can actually repair bone that, that's been really injured. And then stimulation of stem cells. So that's how these, these work. Okay, it's kind of, it's great. It's regenerative medicine. It's pretty amazing. Uh, this is the same technology initially that was started uh, to break up kidney stones in patients. So they shot sound waves at them and it broke up the kidney stones. And then people found out that their back pain started to go away or started to feel better because of the shock waves. So let's go in and talk a little bit about something specific to doctors, which is orthotics. Lots of questions about orthotics. So I'm going to go over some of these. Um, I'm going to first talk about what is the orthotic process. So we do a 3D scan. So we're going to scan your feet in the subtalar joint neutral, which is just the neutral position when you're standing. And we're going to submit the uh, prescription digitally to a lab. They're going to fabricate them in about three to four weeks. There's a way you can get them rushed if you need to. Okay. Um, the orthotic fabrication is going to start and they're going to correct any of the cast to make adjustments. Then they're going to heat mold the orthotic shell and they're going to add padding and different modifications. So it's all custom made just for you based on this three-dimensional scan that we do of your foot. Um, then you're going to dispense it. We're going to dispense the orthotics, give you written break-in instructions. And even if you have them before, I recommend going slowly. Okay. And then we do a six-week follow-up. We're going to evaluate, see how you're doing. We're going to adjust the orthotics if needed. Um, do any modifications, and then we're going to adjust them until they're comfortable. We can guarantee comfort. We can't guarantee they're going to make the, all the, the foot pain go away. Why? Because it's not just an orthotic. It's orthotic, it's foam rolling, it's regenerative treatments, everything kind of together. It's not just one thing. And then we're going to do a yearly follow-up just to, to make sure you're pleased with them. Uh, you can do any additional pairs. Many of my patients get two pairs because most people have two types of shoes they wear and it just helps with compliance. Um, and you can do that. Then I'll see you back yearly to see how they're going. Okay. There's some other questions that patients had, uh, the difference between custom and non-custom. And so I wanted to go over this, uh, for non-custom inserts, which many people try before they see me, they're inexpensive, like 20 to $60. Um, you can start using them fast. They're easily accessible. They're good enough for, for many of our patients, right? They're going to try them. They're going to do, okay. The problem is they wear out in about three months. They don't last that long. Um, they're hard to, hard to find the perfect one, especially if you have an abnormal foot, like a lot of flatness or a high arch or something else like that, hard for difficult feet. They're not going to conform to your arch and they're not going to really remove that much pressure. Remember what I said about stress, you want to remove stress and then uh, you can't really modify them. Uh, the benefits of custom is that they last, uh, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, they're prescribed for you. They have a lot of bells and whistles in them. So they have everything that you need, all the different pads and cutouts and things like that. Um, they're going to remove pressure better uh, and they're going to improve your posture. And we guarantee that there's going to be uh, comfort to them. Uh, the problem is the cost. So everyone charges differently. We charge 550 at the time of the making this video. Um, some think that's a lot. Some things that it isn't a lot. There's a discount for a second pair, but it really works. And so patients are pleased. Uh, they're custom and they may need uh, modifications for the custom orthotics. So that's what orthotics. Um, can't I just use over-the-counter inserts? You certainly can, you can try them, but you kind of get what you pay for, like in anything. And I, and I find uh, ours are specifically a lot less than one of these, some of these places. There's this new store out there, I'm not gonna say the name, but they have these over-the-counter ones, they're plastic and they're like $1,600 for, for, I think there's two of them they give you. But still, that's a lot for something that's not custom that they can give you that same day. So if you go somewhere and they try to sell you something and they say it's, it's custom and they give it to you that same day, it's really not custom, okay? Unless they have a 3D print, printer back there and they can print them. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to say maybe they're like hand, hand, you know, they're custom molded for your foot or custom tailored or something like that, but they're really not custom. Um, my shoe says it has an orthotic inside. Is that true? So there are some orthotics. Um, they call them orthotic shoes. Really a shoe that has a good arch support, they say it's an orthotic, it really isn't orthotic. Orthotics, you pull out the sock liner and you put the orthotic in there. Um, they take about three to four weeks to make. They last you know, anywhere between five and 10 years. It really depends on usage. And are they covered by insurance? In Massachusetts, where I'm at, they're usually not, uh, but some insurances do have them covered. Um, something else that you can't do on your own would be physical therapy. I'm a big advocate of physical therapy. This is an example of a Graston technique that most of my patients get on the back of the calf. Um, and so there's a lot of questions that patients ask me about physical therapy. Uh, I'll, I'll suffice it to say though, patients get better with physical therapy. They get better faster, but I want to be clear, not all physical therapists are created equal. Okay. So you have to find one once again, that sees a lot of plantar fasciitis and has success at treating it. 
So can I just do my own stretching at home? You can, and you should do that in conjunction, but people that go to PT get better faster. Why do I need physical therapy? Well, they're gonna evaluate a lot of other things. They're gonna evaluate the tightness. They're gonna evaluate your hip. They're gonna look at your knee. They're gonna look specifically at your core and other things that could be contributing to your, to your issue. Uh, can I just buy the tools for grasp and online? You can, but you probably don't know how to use them. You haven't had training to use them. Those are those hard metal things that you rub. Uh, is massage, acupuncture, and seeing my chiropractor better? So in my opinion, my number one referral source I send to is physical therapy. People, if they're not getting better, a lot of patients come into me when they're desperate, okay? And so what they do is they say, can I go to massage, acupuncture, and my chiropractor? I say, let's start with what I know works, and then you can do those other things, okay? But I find you don't want to muddy the waters with too many types of treatments. How often will I go to PT? Most PT places do twice a week for six weeks. There are certain ones, uh, some people that I've interviewed in my, I have a healthy living um, TV program that I've done. And some of these concierge physical therapists, they might see you just as you need them. So they might usually cash pay. You don't need to see them as often. And they kind of teach you for more motivated people. Uh, can, I, uh, can I just go to anyone that I want? You can, but beware if they're not seeing a lot of plantar fasciitis and they don't know how to do all the treatments, you have to be, be wary. If they don't know what foam rolling is and all they're having you do is do ankle stretches and um, putting like heat on it, you want someone that's doing manual therapy. Um, and what will they do that I can't do on my own? They do a lot, okay? They do the Graston technique. They do ankle mobilization. They're going to evaluate, do something called a functional movement screen. So there's a lot that they're going to do. Um, I had a bad experience and a waste of time in the past. Do I need to go? I get that a lot. Yes, you do. I'm going to send you to a place or your doctor should send you to a place that does a lot of physical therapy. Okay. A couple of other things that can be done uh, to reduce stress and strain in your foot. We don't do this for everyone, but there is a non-custom ankle foot orthotic right here. And this is called a walking boot. So a walking boot, I usually use this if I'm doing an amnio injection in someone or if I have cortisone injection, or if I'm concerned there's a rupture in the fascia. And I'll do this occasionally for patients that have a lot of pronation or flatness in their foot. And this will avoid that, that pronation in their foot. Okay. And this is the socks we're talking about. Um, when is a compression sock or sleeve recommended? Once again, with swelling, uh, what about using the padding? Uh, there's a padded arch support that some patients come in with. It's basically like a, a, a elastic uh, strap that goes around the foot with a pad. Some people like it. There's one that's an air filled one. There's different versions of that. They're okay. I haven't really, I can only recommend so many things to patients, right? They're, otherwise it just gets overwhelming. I already told you when I recommend a walking boot, if I'm concerned about a rupture or if I'm doing a uh, cortisone injection that I'm concerned with or a amnio injection. How long do I need to stay in the boot? I usually don't keep patients that much in their boot uh, that, that long. Uh, even for really chronic plantar fasciitis, I'll, I would prefer something called an ankle foot orthotic. I'll explain that because a boot just throws your hips off. You have to use an even up. Just remember, if you get a boot, get an even up for the other shoe. So if you don't know what it is, you can Google it. It's something that goes on the other shoe to lift it up a little bit so you don't throw your hips off. And what is a brace recommend for my foot? I like braces if you're having to wear a walking boot for a long period of time. That's when I would do either that other brace that I showed you or this type of a brace. This is an offloading brace. Uh, it's a brace um, that you can see this is carbon fiber. There's a carbon fiber little thing in the front. And this can be used for a drop foot, can be used for a lot of things. I use it to take pressure off the foot for plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. It goes up the front of your leg. And so when you stand and you strap this, it's going to take about 50% of the pressure off your foot. And it does that by, by this mechanism. It's carbon fiber. So it, bear, it bears your weight. So this base up here, going up to here, it bears your weight. And there's an orthotic that goes inside of it. Now, this is pretty cool. Um, not all of my patients get this. It's usually, usually more for chronic plantar fasciitis that's been there for a long time. And I'm really struggling to get better. That's when I'll do this type of a brace for them. Uh, when would I consider it? Once again, if it's more of a chronic thing that you, or you have had it for a long time and haven't had treatment, or you're just really suffering and um, you can't walk because of the pain. How long will I need the brace? Not forever, hopefully. Hopefully it's just until things calm down until we can do the other treatments. How is it made? Uh, usually the orthotic, you cast for the orthotic and then the brace comes with it. It's The brace is non-custom, but the orthotics are custom. And it, that, that's something that's usually covered by insurance. That's the neat thing about it. Whereas uh, custom orthotics in Massachusetts anywhere isn't covered, but that one is. Um, now we're going to get into injections. Um, this is an example of, of uh, so example, the heel, and this is an example of the fascia, kind of where you would do the, the cortisone injection with an ultrasound. Here's an example. Don't get grossed out with this, but where we kind of put it on the side of the foot. I'll usually do it with an ultrasound so I can look at the area that's injured. Um, what I talked about before is um, 
there is a, a certain issues where I do an ultrasound and I see areas of black. This is called an effusion. So in this area, this is where you can inject the amnio. This is where you can help that heal faster. Amniotic stem cells uh, just help things heal up uh, a lot quicker. It's from a donating mother and they're really potent cells to bring healing and they're, they're not a steroid. So I still do occasional cortisone injections with an ultrasound and I, but I mostly do amnio or the shockwave because I just think it's more, it's more natural and people get better faster. Um, some questions, when is a cortisone injection recommended? In my opinion, a cortisone is recommended if your pain, basically if you come in, you're limping. If you just, you're limping with every step, that's when I would do a cortisone. Your pain is what I call an eight, nine or a 10 and you just can't bear it. I'll do a cortisone to calm things down. And then I can't do any shockwave for eight weeks after that. So um, that, that's when I would consider if you need something else or I'd put you into a boot if you're in a lot of pain or do that AFO thing I talked about, that ankle foot orthotic. How long does it last? It usually lasts about two months. Uh, and then, then pain many times comes back. Even after a couple of weeks, it might come back. I use a combination of two, a short and a long acting anti-inflammatory. And a, I'm sorry, short and long acting um, anesthetic and a short and a long acting uh, steroid that I put in there. Uh, do they hurt? Um, I guess it's a needle in your foot. So it's going to hurt a little bit, especially because that's where it's hurting you. I use a little cold spray to help. Um, why do you do an ultrasound? I do an ultrasound so I can see right where I'm putting it versus kind of guessing. And uh, when do I recommend an amnio? So an amnio injection is done usually in conjunction with shockwave. I'll do it on the second uh, treatment. So the first shockwave I'll do. Next week, I'll do the second one. I'll do the shockwave first, and then I'll do the amnio with an ultrasound guidance. That's for an area that has like an effusion, an area of uh, injury or a lot of inflammation where I can either pepper, pepper the... Um, the amnio in there or other types, there are other areas in the foot that I do that as well. So these are some of the advanced treatments. Um, shockwave, amnio, platelet-rich plasma is another one that you might hear about. And we, we everything I do is to try to avoid surgery. Um, I'm not gonna go into in-depth in surgery because I don't have to tend to do that much surgery. There are some surgical procedures. Uh, when should I consider surgery? If you've tried all the other things and they're not getting better, that's where you might wanna consider like a plantar fasciotomy, which would be cutting through the, the plantar fascia. Okay. I'm not going to go in deep. You can, you can kind of look at other videos about surgery. Um, if you guys want to learn more, if you still want more help, you can come see me. I go to drbelta.com. I'm in Westboro and Worcester. I hope you enjoyed this. This was really kind of, I've never seen anything so comprehensive. <laughs> if you liked it, please let me know if this is beneficial. Um, if you also want to learn more, I do it. This is the page I give to my patients, drbelta.com slash heal the information on plantar fasciitis. So once again, hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, until, until next time. Okay. Thank you.